All right. All right, we're going to look at the population of the kingdom of light and then the kingdom of darkness. Um, and we're talking, we're talking about this age, okay? Um, in other ages, it's a little more complicated who's who. I point you to the example of King Saul. King Saul... And he died in the first couple of years of his reign, according to Old Testament scheme of things, probably would have gone to heaven. But by the time he finished up, he didn't make it, frankly. He lost it. Never got it back. Um, this is where people get the idea that you can lose your salvation. And, they, and you know, then they also believe you can get it back. Well... Uh, in the Old Testament, some people lost their salvation, never got it back. Some people lost it and got it back. Um, but usually when God gave a person back into favor, they had to do something. And sometimes it cost them their life. i give you the example of Samson. Now Samson, he, uh, he slipped in and out of the faith. But when he ended his life, he ended it uh, doing what God called him to do. And, of course, it's an evil, wicked world they lived in then. And uh, he said, well, he killed a bunch of people. Well, they were God's enemies, and they were killing God's people. Um, I think the world would have cheered had someone actually assassinated Adolf Hitler. They tried. Um, matter of fact, some, some Germans tried to assassinate him. Uh, there's a... Um, there's a very interesting story. I think they've made a movie out of it. I know that it was a book uh, written by one of the the uh, kind of key players in the conspiracy to kill him. And uh, well, they didn't. They didn't make it. They tried to plant a bomb in one of his conference tables. Um, so in this age, it's really easy. All you have to do is get saved. Save people. The saved of the body of Christ, which is the church. Now, there's something I, I want to clear up, make it real clear. All right, the Bible talks about the church sometimes. And it's talking about the body of Christ. And in this age, that's synonymous with the kingdom of light. All right, say, so who, who are these people? Well, it's everybody that was saved from the thief on the cross all the way to the rapture. Okay? Everybody that got saved. Little kids, old people, no matter who it was, all the way back. Uh, Greeks, Romans, you know, it doesn't matter. Wherever the gospel went, people got saved. They went into the body of Christ. Now, this church has never had a meeting. It doesn't have a building. It doesn't take offerings. It doesn't have a missions program. Because it's never met before. Now, one of these days, we're going to have a meeting. You think about the meeting in the air? This is what we're talking about. <laughs> We're going to have a church meeting right in the middle of there. <laughs> I bet that's going to be huge. So, you're a member, when you get saved, you're put into this. Okay? Now, there's some of the Baptists that get this all confused. Because there's another thing that the Bible refers to as the church. But it's the church at. Ephesus. Okay, I don't know if write that. Ephesus. Or Philippi. Or Pensacola. Now, what's happened to local churches is that they split into denominations. They split into uh, different factions in the denominations. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's 152 Baptist bodies 
in the United States. 152 of them. Of which we're not part of any of them. Because we're independent. And there's even independent groups. Which I don't see how that works. Now, I guess you could say we're affiliated with Pensacola Bible Institute somewhat. But that's not where all our missionaries come from. We have them that were educated at Tennessee Temple and Jack Kyle's school or, or uh, Bob Jones. Uh, there's all kinds of places. I, I preached up in Iowa with a fellow that was a graduate from Bob Jones. He runs a, a plane ministry where he flies people around. Now, um, so this is a local church. In the modern age, we have many local churches at a, at a town, usually. Now, back in the pioneer days, maybe, or or maybe up into the, the last part of the 1800s, when people were still traveling west, and there were little bitty towns of four or five hundred people out on the prairie somewhere, you might have one church. Uh, a lot of times, the Methodists met on the first Sunday, and the Baptists used the church on the second Sunday, and... Some other denomination used it on the fourth, uh, third Sunday, and the fourth Sunday maybe they had a communal meeting of everybody. That was very, very, very common in the United States. But then we started kind of building our own thing and building, and that kind of thing kind of, kind of went by the way. Uh, now the Methodists still have traveling preachers, and they, they do that a lot. The Methodist bodies do. Um, the Baptists used to have circuit riders too. They weren't real famous for it, but they, they had them. But our church was founded in 1981 by a fellow named John Wheat, missionary to Australia later on. He graduated out of the school that I graduated of. He was a Bible-believing preacher. And many, many gallons of spiritual water have gone under the bridge since 1981. Uh, we met... And, well, they met in the kitchen for a couple weeks, and they rented the firehouse, which was a block that way, and the building's still there, and we had church in the firehouse, and Brother Bill came along, and he said, well, you know, we're not going to rent anymore, we're going to own something. So we went out, we got a piece of land, we fixed up the old barn building that was on it, or it was old general store, and we met there for 30 years. And all of you are familiar with that, and then the, the, the big flood happened. So every church has like a history like that. Um, I was in Pennsylvania somewhere, I'm in the middle of nowhere, and there was a little Baptist church, and their Baptist church was 152 years old. And they had a book they had published, and you could buy it if you wanted to, I didn't want to buy it. But they had a copy of it in the vestibule, and it had a had a picture of every pastor they had, except for the first two, and there were some drawings. <laughs> because photography hadn't come along then. And so the first two pastors, and it's amazing how young the pastors were, and how fast they kind of either burned out or moved along. A couple of them died early. Um, of course, they didn't have the vaccines and things we have now to protect from diseases and they may not even had a doctor around that little place uh, then. But uh, they have the entire history of the church in that book. While I was at uh, downtown working for the printers, uh, there was a fellow came in, and he goes to the uh, First Methodist Church there in Gulf Breeze. Well, he wanted to make a history of his church. So the pastor gave him the blessing, and he, he wrote a history of his church. Well, our job was to put it in type, and his job was to proofread it. Our job was to direct the, the, the galleys. And then once we got the galleys, we shipped, shipped it off to a, a book printer and binder. And he had the niftiest looking hardcover book. And he was so proud of that book when he got it. But I read it. And uh, man, back in the day, that was a going place for the Lord. They wanted souls. They had uh, Bob Jones preached there back in the old days. So... You know, and it was a beach town, huh? and they, they had a big crowd. They had a tent set up. They had a picture of the tent and everything. Um, so uh, the church local um, is the thing that the Bible talks about. Sometimes when the Bible talks, 
it's referring to something that has to do with both of them. Now, does Cindy, is everybody in a local church saved? Probably not. We hope they are. I read the statistic the other day that in the Baptist church, maybe 50, 60% aren't. But like in a Catholic, they call school. 90% probably. Well, old Carl Lightney like thought 90% for the Baptist <laughs> He didn't us no slack at all, Carl Lightney. Like and I don't know, maybe he's right. In a little church, I don't know how that could be true because everybody knows everybody's business. Uh, but in a big church like the one down the street, yeah, I would say that's probably true. First Baptist Church downtown, uh, even even maybe at the Bible Institute, there's probably somebody in there that's not saved. Um, it, it, it does happen. So that's the biggest difference. Everybody in this body is saved, or they wouldn't be in this body. Everybody here is may or may not be saved. <laughs> So when the Bible talks about something to do with saved people, sometimes it does apply to the local church. Um, for instance, the Bible talks about having the Lord's table. Well, we're not going to have the Lord's table to the marriage supper of the Lamb in this group. That's going to be the Lord's table up there. Down here we have the Lord's table. We baptize people. Um, we try to go out and bring people in. Talk about this morning. So that's the difference here. And like I said, pretty much this is synonymous <laughs> with the kingdom of light. Now let, let's go to the Bible and let me let me show you this the scripture. Don't believe it just because I said it. Uh, look at the first Peter, first Peter 2 9. First Peter 2 9. Um, and there, uh, as you see, there's a correction there. On the lesson, um, so why, why I went ahead and copied the lesson with the uh, changes on it because I knew there were some problems uh, with the lesson. That's one of the difficulties of making your own stuff as mistakes. First uh, Peter two nine, brother Vic, read us that. Would you please? Alright, now, this is talking about saved people, so automatically, people in the body of Christ, this would apply to, but notice that it does really apply to the local church mainly, because you're supposed to go out and be a witness, um, and you're peculiar. You say, well, the world looks down on me because I'm a Christian. Well, don't feel bad, they've... They have looked down on every group of Christians that have lived since Jesus Christ went back to heaven. Um, and see, uh, that really doesn't become an issue of any importance till people start persecuting the Christians. And then you know what Christians do? When we're talking about say people, they try to hide their Christianity. And they did this in Russia. You say, why did they do this? Well, to save their lives. Because they hate Christians so bad, they're killing... And that, it's going on in China now. And China's persecuting everybody. Everybody. Now, there's a there's some kind of meditation religion over there called Fung Gong or something like that. And the Japanese hate these people really, really, really bad. Um, mainly because they go against the teaching of, of Mao. And they believe in God. Now they don't specify God. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or the cross. But they don't believe in deifying Mao or the communists. And that's their problem. And of course the Christians don't either. So um, whether they're some kind of saved uh, Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic. And there are such uh, in these persecuted countries. They have to hide themselves a little bit. But it's hard to do because the light shines through, folks. They know you're different. You can try to hide it. Look, if, if, uh, 
If you decided to backslide, Brother Vic, and you went to a bar room this afternoon, they would know you didn't belong there. I guarantee you they would. They'd probably say, what you doing in here? And you'd be embarrassed to turn around and walk out. I know you. Ah, uh, that's a great thing. <laughs> Keeps a lot of people on the straight and narrow. Of course, some people don't like it because it also makes them unpopular. This isn't a popularity contest, what we're doing with Christianity. This is, God left you here to do something for Him. Now, sometimes it's pretty easy. You own a business. You raise a family. You, um, you take care of your, your farm or your land or your goats or your chickens or whatever. And you do it for the Lord. And you do it with the expectation that God's going to put you in situations where you can talk for Him and speak for Him. Um, and then if you want to volunteer some other time to do some work, most churches have plenty of stuff to do. They really do. But notice that you're going to get noticed. Because who's not going to notice the royal priesthood? In the time of David was a big deal. I mean, they put on, they, they made the robes described in, 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 in Numbers and Leviticus and stuff, but they dolled them up. Instead of putting, you know, uh, stuff on their cuffs uh, that wide, they, they put them on that wide. And, and that, that went to Jesus' day. And of course, it, it be kind of came a religion. It didn't, it didn't mean anything spiritually anymore to the Pharisees. They were just showing off. But in David's day, they, they believed the Lord's stuff was the best stuff on earth. And that's why David wanted to build a temple for the Lord. Because here's this raggedy old tent that's been around for a thousand years. Can you imagine what kind of shape it was? Even if they'd replaced it, Every 200 years or every 100 years, you know, it was, it was a raggedy mess. So David wanted something a little more permanent, something that was going to impress the, 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 the worshipers of Dagon and the other gods. He, he wanted to glorify God. And so you're going to get noticed, and this is who... But notice what's happened to you. You've gone from darkness to the light. Many Christians do understand the kingdom of darkness because they stayed so long in it. Take someone like Charlie Andrews up in Birmingham, Alabama. That fellow used to be a bar owner and a motorcycle guy. He knows what the kingdom of darkness is all about. You say, well, he's kind of a rough preacher. Well, he's that way for a reason. He wants to wake people up. Um, so uh, we're... We're in this kingdom of light. Turn to uh, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. And we'll look at another little verse here about the population of this kingdom. Uh, notice that it says his marvelous light. His marvelous light. They were... Uh, I was up in my wife's room uh, last night and they had... Uh, they had a movie called The Green Mile, which is about some folks on a, a prison block in Mississippi back in the 30s or 20s. And it's death row. And there's this big old, big old black fellow. I mean, he's huge. I don't know the name of Edgar, but the guy's huge. And they, you know, they put him in the cell, and he, he fills the cell up. Uh, and lucky for them, he was kind of a gentle fellow. Uh, he got accused of killing two girls. They found him holding the girls, but he was crying. What they didn't know was the uh, there was another fellow on death row that came in about the same time. He's the guy that really killed the girls. But this guy had some kind of supernatural power. And uh, there's one that I was watching, and, and they had some little pet mouse or something, and one of the guards was a real stinker, and he smushed the mouse. So they scooped the mouse up, and they gave it to this black guy. And he put it in his hands and blew on the mouse. And, of course, all the actors are sitting there, and they, they had this bright light coming out of the guy's hands. Well, why does Hollywood portray stuff like that? Why is there light? 
Why is there light? And they ascribe it to God. Because in God is light and in Him is, there is no darkness. You say, well, that's a bad imitation. You're right. It's a bad imitation of what goes on. Um, if God did make someone like that, they would probably have some kind of light around them. Um, remember Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration and it was so bright they, you know, they couldn't see? Well, that's down inside of you. That light. Ephesians 5, verse 8. It says, For ye were sometimes darkness. It doesn't even say you were in the kingdom of darkness. You were darkness. Boy, what a thing. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So you populate this kingdom of light. And I got to say, the light is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because there's fewer and fewer Christians that are willing to uh, spread the light, send the light. Um, that's one reason why we come to church. Now, I don't know if you know much about fires, but if you've got a good fire going, you've got some embers down there, some coals. And those coals... They don't really give off any flame, or at least the flame you can see, but they glow. And maybe you have a coal over here that's gone dark. What you do to keep the fire going is you stir the coals up a little bit, and you get that little coal over here that ain't doing so good, and you put it right in the middle of all those bright coals. And then you go back a few minutes later, you know what's happened? That coal that you put in the middle of there is glowing again. Matter of fact, it's glowing as good as the other coals you put it with. That's why you have church. This, this is a this is a bed of coals here. And you come here, maybe you maybe you're not doing so good. Maybe your light's kind of flickering. Maybe you've kind of gone a little dark. You come here and, and you rub off of me and you rub off of her and you rub off of him. And, and not physically, spiritually. And you you should go out of this place, your light's burning a little brighter. So why do we have to come Wednesday night and Sunday? And this is the tragedy why Christians they say, well, things just don't go right in my life. That's because they don't come to the ember bed and get relit. They, they're, they're strangers to the power of God. Now, y'all here, I know, y'all, each and every one of you have seen the power of God in your life. You have. You know why? You've come here and you got stirred up. Paul talks about Timothy getting stirred up. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Now notice that that last verse says we're to walk as the children of light. What does it mean to walk, Clay? What in the Bible says walk? So this is your manner of life. It's, it's how you conduct yourself. It's how you go through life. Let me tell you something, some, some things about life. Maybe you don't know, but I'm going to tell you something about life. The past is past. There's not a thing you can do about what happened tomorrow or even an hour or two minutes ago. It's gone. Don't, don't, don't try to go back. Now you can regret it. You can, uh, you can be sorry. You can confess it if you messed up. But you can't go back and fix it. There's only one person in the universe that can fix that kind of stuff, and that's God himself. Our job is to go forward. And you know what? You can't do anything about tomorrow today either. That's the other thing I need to say. You can't do anything about tomorrow. Tomorrow ain't come yet. Tomorrow ain't come yet. One of the weirdest shows that I ever saw was a science fiction show. It was called The Langoliers. It was written by... I don't know. Uh, what's the guy that writes all the horrors? Stephen King. And these people are on a plane and they land at this airport and there's nobody at the airport. Everybody is gone. And they wander around the airport and they wonder and, and all the machines don't work and 
it, even the doors are tough to get open. And, and there's some kind of scientist or something just traveling with them. And he figures out what they've done is they've landed in the future. And time has to catch up to them. Well, if you could do that, that's probably what would happen. But you can't do that. That's a fictional story. It's a nice story. Something to think about. See, people, people sit around and they think of this stuff. It ain't going to happen. You have to deal with today. Notice it says you are now in Ephesians. You are now. Now is what the... Now. See, that's the thing. You, you can't go to this body and it hasn't met yet. It's not completed yet. The only thing that we can do as a church, as an individual... Is work on this word here. What are we doing now? Well, the Homer used to say, "It really doesn't matter what, what you, you know, what you did on the altar uh, a year ago or two years ago, or if it was Friday." He would say, "It didn't matter what you did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. What are you going to do now? This is the invitation. Now you come down. Now you deal with God now." And that's that's a thing of light. Is 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 now First uh, Thessalonians five eight. But let us. <laughs> that's a good salad. Who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a hel and helmet, the hope of salvation. You see that? God says, okay, you're the children of light. Now let's go out and do stuff. Get your armor on. Go out there and fight the battle and do the best you can every day because you are a children of light and you're populating my kingdom. They call churches lighthouses for a reason. Um... Now they have automatic lighthouses where they're computer driven. They, they have some kind of framework. They put this big light on there. They have some kind of computer doohickey GPS thingy or some other kind of control thing. And somebody in, a, in an office long ways away, he, he runs that lighthouse. But back in the old days, you had a keeper, and he lived there with his family. And he had to go up and he had to clean the lenses and uh, make sure all the fuel was in uh, for, for the lamps and, and make sure it rotated properly and, and maintain all that stuff and, and make, sure, make sure there was no obstructions for the light. And it was a lot of work to make a lighthouse work. It's a lot of work to make the light go out to where it needs to be. But there's people out there especially in holiday times. This is why we give to the favor house. Because those people are shipped, their lives have been shipwrecked. You say, well, what can a toy do? You'd be surprised. If nothing else, they know that Open Door Baptist Church loves them, having never met them. Well, who came to die on the cross and loved us and never met us? It's a, it's a godly thing to do. We are to act like light. To act like light? Yeah, act like light. Because we're in the kingdom of light. Uh, 1 John 1. 1 John 1. So how do you act like light? Huh. That's a good question. And if you ask a scientist how light acted, he would give you two or three answers. He really would. If you ask a scientist what light is, he would kind of hem and haw around for a while. For a long time, they thought light was a particle. A particle of light. And when you had a bunch of light, it was a bunch of particles. And, of course, you know, uh, All right, you got a BB and a BB gun, okay? You pump it up and you shoot it. How does it go out of the gun, Brother Clay? Air power. Which direction does it go? Where we point it. 
things light does is brighten things up. Look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. The, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Well, you know, joy is a, a bright, happy thing. Fellowship should be a bright, happy thing. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if you're going to have fellowship with God and he's light, you've got to be light too. If we say then we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. I'm reminded of that lighthouse lens. That lighthouse keeper had to keep those lenses clean. He had to make sure that that light shined through them. Because without that lens, the lighthouse really didn't do anything. It wasn't effective. People died on the rocks coming in. The early lighthouses were just a, a stake with a burning ember on it. That didn't do very good. But when they built those towers and they put those little multifaceted lens and they put that thing up there, that light shone like a beacon out, out to the water and it saved lives. Well, that's what we should be. We should be the fellowship of the light. The fellowship of the light. And if we walk in darkness... Shame on us. Shame on us. He implies here those people walking in darkness professing that their light are, are, are not true people. They're not really Christians. But you've got to be careful. Especially as a pastor. You look at people and you look at their lives and some people you, you really wonder about because you can't tell. And you'll hear preachers say, well, I really can't tell if he's a Christian or not. And they mean it with all their heart because they're living so dark. 
They're living so dark. We are, we are of the light. Let's, uh, we're going to come back to this passage. Next week, we're out of time. And we're going to look at how we act like light. Um, go, to, go to the computer. Get on the Wikipedia thing. And look up light. It's got a very long article. A lot of it's math. Math. It's math that I can't figure out. I look at that and said, I don't know what in the world all that is. I have no clue. If I was Einstein, I might figure it out. But then I kind of scroll past that and get some of the practical things of light. Uh, he's saying, send the light. What are we sending? We go out here and we're supposed to shine the light. So how do we do that? How, we do, how do we populate this kingdom of light and do an effective job as a citizen of light? Heavenly Father, help us now as we take a break and bless us as we uh, have a church time. And I pray you bless our service. and Help us, God, um, to see the light and to be the light and to walk like the light. And Lord, thank you, God, that you're light. And we can love you and you brighten our lives up. God, thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.